welcome to Classical Mechanics 2. In this video, we'll extend the idea of conservation of angular momentum to study continuous mass distributions. Then we'll have a look at what happens when a torque is applied and angular momentum isn't conserved anymore. Extended bodies can undergo two types of motion, linear motion and rotational motion. In linear motion, we treat the entire body as if it were a point mass located at its center of mass. This is how we traditionally set up problems like the two-body central force problem. The center of mass, RCM, is defined for discrete particles as the sum on i of the mass of the ith element times the position of the ith element divided by their total mass. For continuous systems, we can turn this sum into an integral, which says that it is the integral of the position vector r times the infinitesimal mass unit dm divided by the total mass. I should point out that this is only true for Euclidean space. If we had a curved space, this relationship wouldn't hold, primarily because vectors don't add the way they do in Euclidean space. That means we can't just use vector algebra to calculate a unique center point of an object. The surprising consequence of this is that in curved spaces, there isn't a single point where we can reduce an extended body to where all the physics acts on that single point. This is something that my group, in particular Brian Day, is working on right now. They're studying ways of generating translational motion using only internal degrees of freedom in extended bodies in curved spaces. For linear motion, the primary quantities we'll be considering are mass, linear velocity v, linear acceleration a, linear momentum p, which is equal to mass times the linear velocity, force, which is equivalently equal to mass times the linear acceleration a, or the rate of change of the linear momentum. And lastly, kinetic energy, which is one half times the mass of the object times its velocity squared. When extended bodies undergo rotational motions, we can think of that rotation as coming from some point, like an axle, and our body is rotating about that point with some rate omega. All the quantities that we use to describe linear motion, mass becomes the moment of inertia, which is the sum on i of the mass mi at the distance ri from the center squared or in its continuous form, the integral of the distance from the axle squared dm. The analog of velocity is angular velocity, which is given by the vector form of omega, whose magnitude is given by the rate of rotation, and it's oriented along the axis of rotation with its sign given by the right-hand rule. So this vector would be coming out of the screen. We can take the time derivative of this to get the angular acceleration alpha. The rotational analog of linear momentum is angular momentum. This is described alternatively as the distance from the rotation center cross the linear momentum, or i, the moment of inertia, times the angular velocity vector. If we take the time derivative of angular momentum, we get torque. There are three equivalent ways of writing this. The first is the rate of change of the angular momentum, dl by dt or we can take the derivative of each of the definitions of angular momentum, the radius from the center of rotation across the force, and lastly, we can get the moment of inertia times the rate of change of the angular velocity vector, that is i times alpha. Because every infinitesimal mass element in the rigid body is moving, we have an additional rotational component to the kinetic energy given by one half i times omega squared. Let's start by analyzing the rotational motion of an extended body in 2D rotating about a fixed axle here. What happens to this infinitesimal mass element during the rotation? dm is located at a distance ri from the axle. The angular momentum of this element, li, is given by the distance from the axle ri cross its momentum, which is dm times its velocity vi. If the body is rotating at angular speed omega, then the mass element here has tangential speed given by ri times omega. So the angular momentum is now the distance from the axle cross dm times vi, which is the magnitude of ri times the magnitude of omega, and it's acting in the r hat dot direction. Since ri and the velocity of dm are orthogonal, this gives us a vector that's pointing in the z direction, which here is out of the page. And this vector has magnitude ri squared times dm times omega. 
To get the total angular momentum of the system, we need to integrate across all of the mass elements in this object. This gives us omega times the integral of the distance from the axle squared times dm, and it's all in the z-hat direction. Since we're in the xy plane, the distance r squared is just x squared plus y squared in a coordinate system that's centered at the axle. That gives us omega times the moment of inertia in the z direction. This object has kinetic energy given by 1 half the sum on i times the mass of our element times its velocity squared. Using the definition of tangential velocity, we can replace the vi's with ri's times omega, and we get 1 half omega squared times the sum on i of mi ri squared. Or in its integral form, this is 1 half times the integral of r squared dm times omega squared. And we just worked out that this integral is the moment of inertia in the z direction. So the rotational energy of this object is given by 1 half times the moment of inertia in the z direction times omega squared. What if our object is both rotating and translating at the same time? For ease of algebra, we'll assume it's translating at some constant velocity, vcm. The distance from the origin of the coordinate system to the center of mass is given by the vector rcm. Again, we'll look at what happens to an infinitesimal mass element, dm, that's located a vector r prime away from the center of mass, or equivalently the vector r from the origin of the coordinate system. Then the position of the mass element dm is given by rcm plus r prime. And likewise, its velocity is given by vcm plus the velocity of the mass element relative to the center of mass. We can work out this last term by looking at a coordinate system that's centered on the center of mass. Since vcm is constant, this is an inertial frame. Then in this frame, the tangential speed v prime is given by the angular speed omega prime of the object about the center of mass. And this is multiplied by r prime, or the distance from the center of mass to our mass element. Now we'll use this to calculate the total angular momentum of our object, which is given by the integral of the vector r relative to the origin cross the linear momentum of each mass element. Using the definitions of r and v, this is equal to the integral of rcm plus r prime cross vcm plus v prime dm. When we expand this out, we get the first term rcm cross vcm, and those are both constants. So when we integrate over dm, we just get the total mass of the system. The cross terms here cancel out, and we're left with the integral of the position relative to the center of mass cross the velocity relative to the center of mass dm. This gives us one term that looks like the angular momentum of a point mass of mass m that's traveling at a velocity vcm when it is a distance rcm from the origin. And the second term here is the angular momentum of a rigid body rotating at some angular speed omega about its center of mass. This form might look familiar to you if you remember the parallel axis theorem. If we know the moment of inertia of our body rotating about its center of mass, and that's given by icm, then we can calculate the moment of inertia for the same body that's rotating about some other axis that's parallel to the first axis, and the distance between the new axis of rotation and the center of mass is given by the vector r. The parallel axis theorem says that the moment of inertia about the new axis is given by the moment of inertia of the body about its center of mass plus mr squared. So we can use this to work out the kinetic energy for our rotating and translating body. So here the kinetic energy is given by 1 half times the total mass of the body times vcm squared plus the rotational kinetic energy of the body about its center of mass, which is 1 half times the moment of inertia about the center of mass in the z direction times omega prime squared. If you studied quantum mechanics, this decomposition might look familiar to you as splitting the angular momentum into a translational or orbital component and a rotational or spin component. The angular version of Newton's first law says that the angular momentum is conserved unless an external torque is applied to it. 
We'll start by working out what happens when a torque is applied to a point-like particle of mass m traveling at velocity v that's a distance r from the origin. The angular momentum of this particle is r cross its linear momentum p. As with forces, the applied torque is given by the rate of change of the angular momentum, dl by dt, which using the product rule gives us r dot cross p plus r cross p dot. The first term here vanishes because r dot is the velocity and that's parallel to the linear momentum, so the cross product is identically zero. So the torque of a point particle is given by the radius cross the rate of change of momentum, or equivalently, the radius cross the applied force acting on the particle. So what happens if instead of a point-like particle, we have an extended body that's undergoing a torque? It starts with angular speed omega about the origin. Let's look at what happens to an infinitesimal mass element dm that is a distance ri from the origin. As we just worked out, the angular momentum is given by the sum on i of ri cross the linear momentum of the element dm, or pi. If we write pi in terms of the tangential velocity, which is ri times omega, this gives us the sum on i of mi times ri squared, which is the moment of inertia in the z direction, times the angular velocity vector omega. Then the torque is the rate of change of the angular momentum, which is given by the moment of inertia in the z direction times the angular acceleration alpha. As we learned from Noether's theorem, if a system has rotational symmetry, then angular momentum is conserved. Having an external torque on the system breaks this symmetry. What happens now if the center of rotation isn't fixed? We'll explore this with this system. It has two particles, one of mass m1 located at position r1 from the origin of the lab frame, and the other of mass m2 located at position r2. This point here is the center of rotation of the system. But the center of rotation, which is located at position r0 with respect to the lab frame, can also be accelerating. With respect to the center of rotation, Mass m1 is located at position r1 minus r0, and m2 is located at r2 minus r0. The angular momentum of this system is given by the sum on i of the position of each particle cross their individual momenta. So the torque is the rate of change of the angular momentum, which is equal to the sum on i of ri minus r0 cross mi times ri double dot minus r0 double dot. And we'll split this up into two pieces. For the first piece, we're just going to look at the acceleration of the individual particles in the lab frame. This is just the torque on the particles coming from an external force. The second term is a correction that comes from the acceleration of the origin of rotation, which is minus the sum on i of ri minus r0 cross mi times the acceleration of the origin of rotation. We can simplify the sum in this term, which is just the total mass times the definition of the center of mass. Then the net torque on our system is given by the sum on i of ri minus the center of rotation cross the net force acting on each particle minus the total mass of the system times rcm minus the position of the center of rotation cross the acceleration of the center of rotation. We can consider some special cases to help us simplify this. We'll consider three cases. The first is when the origin of rotation is actually at the center of mass. The second is when the origin of rotation is not accelerating. And the third is when the origin of rotation minus the position of the center of mass of the system is parallel to the acceleration of the origin of rotation. In all three of these cases, the second term here, which is the fictitious torque, is zero. And the rate of change of angular momentum then is given by the sum on i of the positions of all of the particles cross the external forces acting on them, which is just the net external torque. We can combine the ideas of conservation of angular momentum and torque to understand what happens in angular collisions. For example, let's start with this extended body here with the center of mass here, and I'm going to give it a kick, and we'd like to know what happens. Throughout most of this problem, there's no net torque on the system, which means that angular momentum is conserved. But what else is conserved? As with regular collisions, there are two types of angular collision, elastic and inelastic. 
in an elastic angular collision, angular momentum, linear momentum, and energy are conserved. Likewise, in an inelastic angular collision, only angular momentum and linear momentum are conserved. During the collision, there's some sort of impulse J acting on the object. Linear impulse is given by the integral from some initial time to some final time of force as a function of time times dt, which gives us the change in linear momentum. Equivalently, we can have an angular impulse denoted by the subscript theta, which is equal to the integral from some initial time to some final time of a time-dependent torque times dt, and this gives us the change in angular momentum. These two types of impulse, combined with the appropriate conserved quantities, enables us to solve for the dynamics of a system that has undergone an angular collision. We'll be returning to these ideas in the future for generalized rotations when we study Euler's equations. In the next video, we'll look at generalized rotations where an object might be rotating about two or more axes as well as translating. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.